the parable of the widow and the unjust judge. And he spoke a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and to faint not, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man, and there was a widow in that city. And she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? This parable has its key hanging at the door. The drift and design of it are prefixed. Christ spoke it with this intent, to teach us that men ought always to pray and not to faint. It supposes that all God's people are praying people, or God's children keep up both a constant and an occasional correspondence with him, send to him statedly and upon every emergency. It is our privilege and honour that we may pray. It is our duty. We ought to pray. We sin if we neglect it. It is to be our constant work. We ought always to pray. It is that which the duty of every day requires. We must pray and never grow weary of praying, nor think of leaving it off till it comes to be swallowed up in everlasting praise. But that which seems particularly designed here is to teach us constancy and perseverance in our requests for some spiritual mercies that we are in pursuit of, relating either to ourselves or to the Church of God. When we are praying for strength against our spiritual enemies, our lusts and corruptions, which are our worst enemies, we must continue instant in prayer. We must pray and not faint, for we shall not seek God's face in vain. So we must likewise, in our prayers, ask for the deliverance of the people of God out of the hands of their persecutors and oppressors. Christ shows, by a parable, the power of importunity among men, who will be swayed by that, when nothing else will influence, to do what is just and right. He gives you an instance of an honest cause that succeeded before an unjust judge, not by the equity or compassionab compassionableness of it, but purely by dint of importunity. Observe here, the bad character of the judge that was in a certain city. He neither feared God nor regarded man. He had no manner of concern either for his conscience or for his reputation. He stood in no awe either of the wrath of God against him or of the censures of men concerning him. Or he took no care to his duty either to God or man. He was a perfect stranger both to godliness and honour and had no notion of either. It is not strange if those that have cast off the fear of their Creator be altogether regardless of their fellow creatures. Where no fear of God is, no good is to be expected. Such a prevalency of irreligion and inhumanity is bad in any, but very bad in a judge, who has power in his hand in the use of which he ought to be guided by the principles of religion and justice, and if he be not instead of doing good with his power, he will be in danger of doing hurt. Wickedness in the place of judgment was one of the sorest evils Solomon saw under the sun in Ecclesiastes chapter 16 verse 2. The distressed case of a poor widow that was nece necessitated to make her appeal to him, being wronged by someone that thought to bear her down with power and terror. She had manifestly right on her side, but, it should seem, in soliciting to have rights done her, she tied not herself to the formalities of the law, but made personal application to the judge from day to day at his own house, still crying, Avenge me of mine adversary, that is, do me justice against mine adversary. Not that she desired to be revenged on him for anything he had done against her, but that he might be obliged to restore what effects he had of hers in his hands, and might be disabled any more to oppress her. Note, 
Poor widows have often many adversaries who barbarously take advantage of their weak and helpless state to invade their rights and defraud them of what little they have, and magistrates are particularly charged not only not to do violence to the widow, but to judge the fatherless and plead for the widow. To be their patrons and protectors, then they are as gods, for God is so. The difficulty and discouragement she met with in her cause, he would not for a while. According to his usual practice, he frowned upon her, took no notice of her cause, but connived at all the wrong her adversary did her, for she had no bribe to give him, no great man whom he stood in any awe of to speak for her, so that he did not at all incline to redress her grievances, and he himself was conscious of the reason of his dilatoriness, and could not but own within himself that he neither feared God nor regarded man. It is sad that a man should know so much amiss of himself and be in no care to amend it. The gaining of her point by continually dunning this unjust judge, because this widow troubleth me, gives me a continual toil, I will hear her cause and do her justice, not so much lest by her clamour against me she bring me into an ill name, as lest by her clamour to me she weary me, for she is resolved that she will give me no rest till it is done. And therefore I will do it, to save myself further trouble, as good at first as at last. Thus she got justice done her by continual craving. She begged it at his door, followed him in the streets, solicited him in open court, and still her cry was avenge me of mine adversary, which he was forced to do, to get rid of her. For his conscience, bad as he was, would not suffer him to send her to prison for an affront upon the court. He applies this for the encouragement of God's praying people to pray with faith and fervency and to persevere therein. He assures them that God will at length be gracious to them. Hear what the unjust judge saith, how he owns himself quite overcome by a constant importunity, and shall not God avenge his own elect? Observe, what is it that they desire and expect, that God would avenge his own elect, Note, there are a people in the world that are God's people, his elect, his own elect, a choice people, a chosen people. And this he has an eye to in all he does for them. It is because they are his chosen, and in pursuance of the choice he has made of them. God's own elect meets with a great deal of trouble and opposition in this world. There are many adversaries that fight against them. Satan is their greatest, their great adversary. That which is wanted and waited for is God's preserving and protecting them, and the work of his hands in them, his securing the interest of the church in the world and his grace in the heart. What is it that is required of God's people in order to the obtaining of this? They must cry day and night to him, not that he needs their remonstrances or can be moved by their pleadings, but this he has made their duty, and to this he has promised mercy. We ought to be particular in praying against our spiritual enemies, as St. Paul was. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me, like this importunate widow. Lord, arm me against this temptation. We ought to concern ourselves for the persecuted and oppressed churches, and to pray that God would do them justice and set them in safety. And herein we must be very urgent. We must cry with earnestness. We must cry day and night, as those that believe prayer will be heard at last. We must wrestle with God, as those that know how to value the blessing and will have no nay. God's praying people are told to give him no rest. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 7. What discouragements they may perhaps meet with in their prayers and expectations, he may bear long with them, and may not presently appear for them in answer to their prayers. He exercises patience towards the adversaries of his people, and does not take vengeance on them, and he exercises the patience of his people, and does not plead for them. He bore long with the cry of the sin of the Egyptians that oppressed Israel, and with the cry of the sorrows of those that were oppressed. What assurance they have that mercy will come at last, though it be delayed, and how it is supported by what the unjust judge saith. 
If this widow prevail by being importunate, much more shall God's elect prevail. For this widow was a stranger, nothing related to the judge. But God's praying people are his own elect, whom he knows and loves and delights in, and has always concerned himself for. She was but one, but the praying people of God are many, all of whom come to him on the same errand and agree to ask what they need. As the saints of heaven surround the throne of grace with their united praises, so saints on earth besiege the throne of grace with their united prayers. She came to a judge that bade her keep her distance. We come to a father that bids us come boldly to him and teaches us to cry, Abba, Father. She came to an unjust judge. We come to a righteous father one that regards his own glory and the comforts of his poor creatures, especially those in distress as widows and fatherless. She came to this judge purely upon her own account, but God is himself engaged in the cause which we are soliciting, and we can say, Arise, O Lord, plead thine own cause, and what wilt thou do to thy great name? She had no friend to speak for her, to add force to her petition, and to use interest for her more than her own. But we have an advocate with the Father, his own Son, who ever lives to make intercession for us, and has, no, and has a powerful prevailing interest in heaven. She had no promise of speeding, no, nor any encouragement given her to ask, but we have the golden scepter held out to us, are told to ask with a promise that it shall be given to us. She could have access to the judge only at some certain times, but we may cry to God day and night at all hours and therefore may the rather hope to prevail by importunity. Her importunity was provoking to the judge and she might fear lest it should set him more against her. But our importunity is pleasing to God. The prayer of the upright is his delight and therefore we may hope shall avail much if it be an effectual fervent prayer. He intimates to them that, notwithstanding this, they will begin to be weary of waiting for him. Nevertheless, though such assurances are given that God will avenge his own elect, yet when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. The Son of Man will come to avenge his own elect, to plead the cause of persecuted Christians against the persecuting Jews. He will come in his providence to plead the cause of his injured people in every age, and at the great day he will come finally to determine the controversies of Zion. Now, when he comes, will he find faith on the earth? The question implies a strong negation. No, he will not. He himself foresees it. This supposes that it is on earth only that there is occasion for faith, for sinners in hell are feeling that which they would not believe, and saints in heaven are enjoying that which they did believe. It supposes that faith is the great thing that Jesus Christ looks for. He looks down upon the children of men, and does not ask, is there innocency, but is there faith? He inquired concerning the faith of those who applied themselves to him for cures. In the Gospels, it supposes that if there were faith, though ever so little, he would discover it and find it out. His eyes is upon the weakest and most obscure believer. It is foretold that when Christ comes to plead his people's cause, he will find but little faith in comparison with what one might expect. That is, in general, he will find but few good people, few that are really and truly good, many that have the form and fashion of godliness, but few that have faith, that are sincere and honest, nay, he will find little fidelity among men, the faith will fail. Even to the end of time, there will still be occasion for the same complaint. The world will grow no better, no, not when it is drawing towards its period. But it is, bad it is, and bad it will be, and worst of all, just before Christ's coming, the last times will be the most perilous. In particular, he will find few that have faith concerning his coming. When he comes to avenge his own elect, he looks if there be any faith to help and to uphold, and wonders that there is none. It intimates that Christ, both in his particular comings for the relief of his people, and in his general coming at the end of time, may and will delay his coming so long as that first wicked people will begin to defy it, and to say, where is the promise of his coming? They will challenge him to come, and his delay will harden them in their wickedness. 
even his own people will begin to despair of it and to conclude he will never come because he has passed their reckoning. God's time to appear for his people is when things are brought to the last extremity and when Zion begins to say, The Lord has forsaken me. But this is our comfort, that when the time appointed comes, it will appear that the unbelief of man has not made the promise of God of no effect. The fountain of every blessing is Christ, who of God was also made unto us wisdom. For in him we are made wise and filled with spiritual gifts. Now anyone who is right-minded will affirm that the knowledge of those things by means of which we may prosper in every method of saintly excellence of life and advance in virtue is God's gift and one well worthy of our winning. And we find one who asked it of God, saying, Show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Now the path which lead those onward to an incorrupt life who eagerly advance therein are numerous, but one which especially benefits those who practice it is prayer. And the Saviour was himself careful to teach us by the parable now set before us that we must make diligent use of it. For he spoke, it says, a parable unto them, to the intent that men ought always to pray and must not grow weary. For it is, I affirm, the duty of those who set apart their lives for his service, not to be sluggish in their prayers, nor again to consider it as a hard and laborious duty, but rather to rejoice because of the freedom of access granted them by God. For he would have us converse with him as sons with a father. Is not this then a privilege worthy of being valued by us most highly? For suppose that some one of those possessed of great earthly power were easy of access to us, and were to permit us to converse with him with full license, should we not consider it as a reason for extraordinary rejoicing? What possible doubt can there be of this? When therefore God permits us each one to offer our addresses unto him for whatever we wish, and has set before those who fear him an honour so truly great and worthy of their gaining, let all slothfulness cease that would lead men to an injurious silence therein, and rather let us draw near with praises, and rejoicing that we have been commanded to converse with the Lord and God of all, having Christ as our mediator, who with God the Father grants us the accomplishment of our supplications. For the blessed Paul somewhere writes, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. And he somewhere himself said to the holy apostles, Hitherto you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and it shall be given unto you. For he is our mediator, our propitiation, our comforter, and the bestower of every request. It is our duty, therefore, to pray without ceasing according to the words of the blessed Paul, as well knowing and being thoroughly assured that he whom we supplicate is able to accomplish all things. For let a man, it says, ask in faith, in nothing divided. For he who is divided is like a wave of the sea, troubled and blown about by the wind. For let not, it says, that man think that he will receive anything of the Lord. For he that is divided is really guilty of mockery. For if you do not believe that he will incline unto you, and gladden you, and fulfill your request, do not draw near to him at all, lest you be found an accuser of the Almighty, and that you foolishly art divided. We must avoid, therefore, so base a malady. But that God will incline his ear to those who offer him their prayers, not carelessly nor negligently, but with earnestness and constancy, the present parable assures us. For if the constant coining of the oppressed widow prevailed upon the unjust judge, who feared not God, neither had any shame at men, so that even against his will he granted her redress, how shall not he, who loves mercy and hates iniquity, and whoever gives his helping hand to them that love him, accept those who draw near to him day and night, and avenge them as being his elect. But come now, and let us examine who it is that offend against them, for the examination of this question will beget much that is of profit to all who are well taught. For very many, and those of various classes, offend against the saints. For the holy ministers and teachers who rightly divide the word of truth are assailed by all who are the truth's enemies, men ignorant of the sacred doctrines and estranged from all uprightness, who walk in the crooked path, remote from the straight and royal road. 
Such are the impure and polluted gangs of heretics, whom one may justly call the gates of destruction, the snares of hell, the pitfalls of the devil, the slough of destruction. These being persecutions and distresses, these bring persecutions and distresses upon such as walk uprightly in the faith, and just as men, drunk with wine and unable to stand, take hold often of those near them, that they may not fall to the earth alone, so also those, as being lame and halt, often bring to ruin with them those who are not steadfast. Against such men must all who are known of God make supplications, imitating the holy apostles who, calling out against the wickedness of the Jews, said, and now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto your servants that with freedom of speech they may declare your word. But perchance someone will say, But lo, Christ somewhere said to the holy apostles, Love your enemies, pray for them who use you despitefully. How then can we cry out against them without despising the divine command? To this we answer, Shall we then pray that boldness and power may be given them by God, that they may more strenuously attack those who praise his doings, not permitting them to teach and resisting the glory of him to whom we address the supplication? But how would not this be through fo thorough folly? Whenever therefore offences are committed by any against us personally, let us immediately ev even count it our glory to be forgiving towards them and full of mutual love and imitating the Holy Fathers, even though they smite and scorn us, yes, even though they inflict violence upon us of every kind, let us free them from all blame, and be superior both to wrath and vexation. Such glorying becomes the saints, and is pleasing to God. But when any sin against the glory of God, heaping up wars and distresses against those who are the ministers of the divine message, then indeed let us at once draw near unto God, beseeching his aid, and crying out against those who resist his glory, just as also the mighty Moses did. For he said, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let all those who hate your name flee away. And the prayer also uttered by the holy apostles shows that it is not without advantage for the success of the divine message for the hand, so to speak, of the persecutors to be weakened. For behold, they say, their threatenings, that is, prove their opposition to be in vain, and grant unto your servants that with freedom of speech they may speak your word. But that men would make merchandise of the word of uprightness and prevail on many to abandon a sound faith, involving them in the inventions of devilish error and belching forth, as scripture says, things out of their own hearts and not out of the mouth of the Lord. He foretold, saying, When the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith upon the earth? It escapes not his knowledge. How could it? Seeing that he is God who knows all things. He tells us then, to use his own words, that the love of many will grow cold, and that in the latter times some shall depart from a correct and blameless faith, going after seducing spirits, and giving heed to the false words of men who are seared in mind, against whom we draw near unto God as faithful servants, praying him that their wickedness and their attempts against his glory may be brought to no effect. And others also there are who wrong the servants of God, and whom we may without sin attack in prayer. And who again are these? They are the evil and opposing powers, and Satan the adversary of us all, who fiercely resists those who would live well, who casts into the pitfalls of wickedness whoever slumbers, who plants in us the seeds of every sin. For with his satellites he presses upon us furiously. And on this account the psalmist called out against them, saying, How long set you yourselves against man, and you slay all of you as it were a leaning wall and a bowing fence? For just as a wall that already leans on one side, and a fence that bows over as having been loosened, readily fall when anyone pushes against them, so also the mind of man, by reason of its own great inclination of itself to the love of worldly pleasures, readily falls into them whenever anyone draws and entices it thereto. And this is Satan's business, and therefore we say in our prayers to him who is able to save and to drive away from us that wicked being, avenge me of my adversary. And this, the only begotten word of God, has indeed done by having become man, for he has ejected from his tyranny over us the ruler of this world, and has delivered and saved us, and put us under the yoke of his kingdom. 
Excellent, therefore, is to make request by constant prayer, for Christ will receive our supplications and fulfill our petitions, by whom and with whom to God the Father be praise and dominion with the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen. The Unwelcome Friend And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed, I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, Though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. The friend asking for bread is a vignette of Palestinian village life, without commercial shops. At daybreak the housewife bakes her family's supply of bread for one day. Towards evening, the other villagers usually know whose supply of bread has not yet been given out. In the East, it was a duty to receive and feed unexpected strangers. The one who asks his friend for bread probably intends to repay the borrowed bread before long. Towards evening, the house is dark, for village people go to bed early. The wick of the oil-filled lamp burns dimly. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. The doors are held shut by a large bolt. They are hard to open, and moving the bolt causes a loud noise that would wake up everyone. The fact that the man's children are with him in bed suggests a dwelling of only one room. To get up to pass out bread would cause inconvenience. One ought not to understand the words, I cannot rise and give thee, as a refusal, but just an allusion to special difficulty that his neighbor put him in. Christ knows that the man will give his friend some bread. Christ is asking his listeners to put themselves in the place of the hospitable man in the East, who must help strangers at any time. Tradition dictates him. One can say the same about the parable of the unjust judge who defended the widow to stop her pestering him. Even more will the Lord God hearken unto us and help us. Both parables teach that constance is necessary to gain what is asked for. Sometimes God does not fulfill our prayer swiftly, even if the request is necessary and according to God's will, and offered with faith and hope. His divine wisdom and omniscience fulfill our prayers according to his providence, sometimes testing our faith and always knowing what is better for us. We must believe that God's providence is best for us. The Holy Fathers also teach us to pray constantly and steadfastly. Ask for what is worthy of God, says St. Basil the Great, not ceasing to ask until thou receivest. Though a month passes, or a year, or three years, or a greater number of years until thou receivest, do not give up, but ask with faith, constantly doing good. We must offer prayer at all times, not only the day, but also the night. You see it indeed. He who in the middle of the night went to ask his friend for three loaves and persevered in his urgent request is not frustrated with his request. What are these three loaves, if not the food of the heavenly mystery? If you love the Lord your God, you will be able to obtain it, not only for yourself but for others. And who is more our friend than the one who for us delivered his body? It was to him that in the middle of the night David asked for loaves, and he received them. For he asked, and when he said, In the midst of the night I rose up to praise you, in Psalms 118 and 62. So he got those loaves he served to us to eat. He asked when he said, I will bathe my bed every night, in Psalms 6 and 7. For he was not afraid to awaken in his sleep, he whom he always knows, in awakening and acting. So remembering the scriptures, let us pray day and night to beg forgiveness of our sins. For if such a saint, taken by the duties of kingship, said his praise to the Lord seven times a day, always attentive to the morning and evening sacrifices, what should we do? We must all the more ask that we fail more frequently by weakness. 
of the flesh and the spirit, so that, weary of the way, very tired of the course of this world and the circuits of this life, we were not lacking for our repair, bread that strengthens the heart of man. And it is not only in the middle of the night, but almost every moment that the Lord recommends to watch, for he comes in the evening and in the second and the third watch, and he is in the habit of striking. Blessed therefore are the servants whom the Lord will find awake at his coming. If therefore you desire that the power of God be prepared and serve you, you must always watch, for there are many pitfalls around us, and heavy is the sleep of the body. If the soul begins to sleep, it will lose its vigor and strength. Shake your sleep to knock on the door of Christ. This door, Paul also asks, that it be open to him. Not satisfied with his prayers, he begs that those of the people assist him, so that the door is open to him to speak of the mystery of Christ. And perhaps it is the door that John has seen opened, for he saw it and said, After that I saw, and here is a door open in heaven, and the voice that I first heard spoke to me like a trumpet and said, Go up here, and I will show you what is to be done. The book of Revelations, chapter 4, verse 1. The door opened for Jean, for John, the door opened for Paul, so that he would receive for us the bread that we would eat. For he persisted in knocking on the door, by the way, out of purpose, in order to revive the Gentiles, tired and weary of the road of the world, by the abundance of heavenly food. This passage, therefore, gives the precept to pray often, the hope of obtaining, the art of persuading, first by precept, then by example. For when one promises a thing, one must obtain the hope of what is promised, so that there is obedience to the opinions, faith to the promises. The latter, thinking of human goodness, acquires even more the hope of eternal goodness. Still, it is necessary to make just demands, so that prayer does not become sin. And he, St. Paul, did not blush to ask a thing often, not to seem unconvinced in the mercy of the Lord, or proudly offended at not having obtained something from the first prayer. Also, says I, have prayed the Lord three times. And it shows that God often does not grant what he is prayed for, because he considers useless what we think should be advantageous to us. The language of the divinely inspired scripture is constantly, so to speak, profound, nor will it bend itself for those to be able to understand it who merely wish to do so, but only for those who know how to search it well, and are enriched with the divine light in their mind, by means of which they attain to the meaning of hidden truths. Let us therefore ask for the understanding which comes from above, from God, and the illumination of the Holy Ghost, that we may attain to a correct and unerring method, whereby we may be enabled to see the truth contained in the passage set before us. We have heard then what the Saviour said in the parable, now read to us, which if we understand we shall find to be laden with benefits, and the order of the ideas is very wonderful. For the Saviour of all had taught at the request of the holy apostles in what way we ought to pray. But it was possible that those who had obtained from him this precious and saving lesson might sometimes make indeed their supplications according to the pattern given them, but would do so warily and lazily. And so, when not heard at their first or second prayer, would desist from their supplications as being unavailing to their benefit. In order, therefore, that we may not experience this, nor suffer the injury that would result from such littleness of mind, he teaches us that we must diligently continue the practice, and in the form of a parable, plainly shows that weariness in prayer is to our loss, while patience therein is greatly to our profit. For it is our duty to persevere, without giving way to indolence. And this he teaches us by saying, that though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, because of his importunity he will rise and give him as much as he needs. And now come and let us transfer to the truth what was shown in the form of a parable. Be urgent in prayer. Draw near to God who loves to be kind and that very constantly, and if you see that the gift of grace is delayed, yield not to weariness, despair not of the expected blessing, 
Abandon not the hope set before you, nor further foolishly say within yourself, I have drawn near frequently, I have gained absolutely nothing, I have wept and received not, I have supplicated but not been accepted, for of all I asked nothing has been accomplished. Rather think thus within yourself, that he who is the universal treasure house better knows our state than we do, in that he wades to every man what is due and suitable to him. You ask sometimes what is beyond your measure. You wish to receive those things of which you are not yet worthy. The giver himself knows the time suitable for his gifts. Earthly fathers do not immediately and without discretion fulfill the desire of their sons, but often delay in spite of their asking. And that not because they have a grudging hand, nor again because they regard merely what is pleasant to the petitioners, but as considering what is useful and necessary for their good conduct. And how will that rich and bounteous giver neglect the duo accomplishment for men of what they pray for, unless of course, and without all doubt, he knows that it would not be for the benefit to receive what they ask. We must therefore offer our prayers to God with knowledge, as well as with assiduity, and even though there be some delay in your requests, continue patiently with the vineyard workers, as being well assured that what is gained without toil and readily won is usually despised. Whereas that which is gathered with labour is a more pleasant and abiding possession. But perchance to this you say, I draw near frequently making requests, but the vintage therefore therefrom has wandered far away. I am not slothful in supplications, but persevering and very importunate. Who will assure me that I shall receive? Who is my security that I shall not labour in vain? Therefore I also say to you, and it is the bestower of divine gifts who himself enters and speaks. I also say to you, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened to you. For every one that asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and whosoever knocks, it shall be open to him. In these words I say to you, has the full force of an oath, not that God is false, even though the promise be not accompanied with an oath, but to show that the littleness of their faith was groundless. He sometimes confirms his hearers by an oath. For the Saviour is also found in many places, prefacing his words by saying, Verily, verily, or truly I say to you, as therefore he makes this very promise an oath, it is not a thing free from guilt to disbelieve it. In telling us therefore to seek, he bids us labour, for by labour that which is needed is always, so to say, found, especially when it is something fit for us to possess. He who knocks, not once merely, but again and again, rattles the door with his hand, it may be, or with a stone, so that the master of the house, unable to endure the annoyance of the knocks, will open it even against his will. Learn, therefore, even from what happens among us, the way to gain that which is to your profit. Knock, be urgent, ask. So must all act who ask anything of God. For wise Paul writes, pray without ceasing. We are in need of urgent prayer, because many are the turmoils of worldly matters which encircle us around. For that many-headed serpent greatly distresses us, involving us sometimes in unexpected difficulties, that he may humble us to baseness and manifold sin. And, besides this, there is also the inbred law of voluptuousness lurking in our fleshly members, and warring, as scripture says, against the law of our mind. And lastly, the enemies of the doctrines of truth, even the impure and polluted gangs of heretics, oppose those who wish to hold correct opinions. Constant and earnest prayer, therefore, is necessary, for arms and the implements of warfare are needed for soldiers, that they may be able to overcome those who are drawn up against them. And for us, prayer, for our weapons, as scripture says, are not carnal, but mighty to God. And this too we ought to add as being, in my opinion, amply sufficient to quicken us to prayer. The Saviour and Lord of all is seen again and again passing the night in prayer. And when too he was about to undergo his saving passion upon the precious cross, he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Was this because life was afraid of death? 
Was it because there was no escape for him from the net, no deliverance from the snare, and that the hand of the Jews was mightier than his power? And how is it not altogether abominable to think or speak thus? He was by nature God and the Lord of powers, and even though he was in form, like to us, this was so. Of his own will he took upon himself the suffering upon the cross, because he was the helper of us all. What need was there then of prayer? It was that we might learn that supplication is becoming and full of benefits, and that we must be constant in it whenever temptation befall, and the cruelty of enemies press upon us like a wave. And to put it in one more light, for man to converse with God is a very great honour to human nature, and this we do in prayer, being commanded to address the Lord as Father, for we say, Our Father. But if he be a father, necessarily he both loves and generously cherishes his sons and daughters, and honours them, of course, and counts them worthy of indulgence. Draw near, therefore, in faith with perseverance, as being well assured that to those who ask urgently, Christ bows his ear. Let us trust in God's will, for God knows better than we. Let us show constancy and patience in our prayer. The Canaanite women, in the gospel narrative of the healing of her daughter by Christ, is an example of astonishing constancy and persistence in prayer. She would not leave the Saviour. Let us recall this gospel account. A woman of Canaan cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. The Lord's silence vexes his disciples, who could hear the woman entreating. They asked Christ to send her away, not understanding the Saviour's silence. And Lord's reply transfigures the harsh scene. I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, says the Lord. In spite of this negative answer from Christ, the Canaanite woman approaches him and says, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. This reply may seem sharp and even cruel to us, and it could offend most women. He compares her people to dogs, but her answer is not that way. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And then the words of the Lord revealed the meaning of this gospel episode. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. His encounter with the Canaanite woman shows the whole world this woman's faith, humility, and persistence. Let us too, beloved, follow her example. And which of you that shall ask his father bread, will he offer him a stone? Or if he ask of him a fish, will he for a fish offer him a serpent? If he ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you, therefore, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall the Heavenly Father give a good spirit to them that ask him? To love instruction and be fond of hearing become saints. But those who are thus minded must, I say, keep in remembrance and store up in the treasure house of their heart whatsoever has been spoken by those who are skillful in teaching right doctrine and whose study it is ably to initiate men in the truth. For this is both profitable to themselves for their spiritual improvement, and besides, it rejoices the teacher, just, for instance, as the seed also gladdens the husbandman when it springs up, as having been well covered in the furrow, and escaped being the food of birds. You, therefore, remember that at our last meeting we addressed you on the duty of praying without ceasing, and making supplication continually, in offering our requests to God, and that we must not give way to any littleness of soul, nor at all grow weary, even though he somewhat delay his gift, considering that he knows whatsoever is to our benefit, and that the fitting season for his bounties is not forgotten by him. The Saviour again teaches another point most useful for our edification, and what this is, come, that we may declare it as to sons, 
we sometimes draw near to our bounteous God, offering Him petitions for various objects, according to each one's pleasure. But occasionally, without discernment, or any careful examination, what truly is to our advantage, and if granted by God would prove a blessing, and what would be to our injury if we received it. Rather, by the inconsiderate impulse of our fancy, we fall into desires replete with ruin, and which thrust the souls of those that entertain them into the snare of death and the meshes of hell. When, therefore, we ask of God aught of this kind, we shall by no means receive it. On the contrary, we offer a petition fit only for ridicule. And why shall we not receive it? Is the God of all weary of bestowing gifts upon us? By no means. Why then, someone forsooth may say, will he not give, since he is bounteous in giving? Let us learn of him, or rather, you have already heard him here saying, What man is there of you? Whom, if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Understand, he says, by an image or plain example taken from what happens among you, the meaning of what I say. You are the father of children. You have in you the sharp spur of natural affection towards them. In every way you wish to benefit them. When, therefore, he says, one asks of you bread, without delay and with pleasure you give it, as knowing well that he seeks of you wholesome food. But when, from want of understanding, a little child that knows not yet how to distinguish what it sees, nor moreover what is the service and use of the various objects that fall in our way, asks for stones to eat, do you, he says, give them, or rather do you not make him desist from any such desire as would be to his injury? And the same reasoning holds good of the serpent and fish and the egg and scorpion. If he ask a fish, you will grant it, but if he see a serpent and wish to seize it, you will hold back the child's hand. If he want an egg, you will offer it at once, and encourage his desire after things of this sort, that the infant may advance to riper age. But if he see a scorpion creeping about and run after it, imagining it to be something pretty, and as being ignorant of the harm it can do, you will, I suppose, of course stop him and not let him be injured by the noxious animal. When, therefore, he says, you who are evil, by which he means you whose mind is capable of being influenced by evil, and not uniformly inclined to good like the God of all, you know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more shall your heavenly Father give a good spirit to them that ask him? And by a good spirit he means spiritual grace, for this in every way is good. And if a man receive it, he will become most blessed and worthy of admiration. Most ready, therefore, is our Heavenly Father to bestow gifts upon us, so that whosoever is denied what he asks is himself the cause of it. For he asks, as I said, what God will not give. For God wishes us to be holy and blameless and to advance uprightly and boldly in every good work, walking apart from everything that defiles and from the love of fleshly pleasure and rejecting the anxieties of worldly pursuits, not involving ourselves in worldly business, not living profligately and carelessly, not delighting in unruly pleasures, nor moreover practicing a dissolute mode of life, but desiring to live well and wisely and in accordance with God's commands making the law which he gave us the regulator of our conduct and earnest in the pursuit of whatever tends chiefly to our edification. If therefore you wish to receive aught of this kind, draw near with joy, for our Father who is in heaven, because he loves virtue, will readily incline his ear. Examine therefore your prayer, for if you ask aught by receiving which you will become a lover of God, God, as I said, will grant it, but if it be anything unreasonable, or that is able to do you an injury, he will withhold his hand. He will not bestow the wished-for object, in order that neither he may give nothing of an injurious nature, for this is completely alien from him, nor let you harm yourself by receiving it. And let me explain how, for which purpose I shall bring forward examples. When you ask for wealth, you will not receive it of God. And why? Because it separates the heart of man from him. 
Wealth begets pride, voluptuousness, and the love of pleasure, and brings men down to the pitfalls of worldly lusts. And so one of the disciples of our Lord has taught us, saying, Whence are there wars and whence quarrels among you? Is it not hence from your lusts that war in your members? You lust and have not, you seek and find not, you ask and receive not, because you ask wickedly, that you may spend it on your own pleasures. When you ask worldly power, God will turn away his face, for he knows that it is a most injurious thing to those who possess it. For constantly, so to speak, charges of oppression attach themselves to those who possess worldly power. And those are for the most part proud and un bridled and boastful, who are set in temporal dignities. When you ask for any to perish or be exposed to inevitable tortures because they have annoyed or molested you in any way, God will not grant it, for he wills us to be long-suffering in mind, and not to requite anyone with evil for evil, but to pray for those who spoil us, to do good to those who injure us, and be imitators of his kindness. For this reason Solomon was praised. For when offering up prayers to God, he said, And you shall give your servant a heart to hear and to judge your people righteously. And it pleased the Lord that Solomon asked this thing. And what did God, who loves virtue, say to him? Because you have not asked for, you, for many days, nor have asked the lives of your enemies, but have asked for understanding and to hear judgment. See, I have done what you said. See, I have given you a heart, prudent and wise. You, therefore, should ask the bestowal without stint of spiritual gifts. Ask strength that you may be able manfully to resist every fleshly lust. Ask of God and uncover his disposition, long-suffering, gentleness, and the mother and nurse of all good, I mean, patience. Ask calmness of temper, continence, a pure heart, and further, ask also the wisdom that comes from him. These things he will give readily, these save the soul, these work in it that better beauty and imprint in its God's image. This is the spiritual wealth, the riches that has never to be abandoned. These prepare us for the lot of the saints and make us members of the company of the holy angels. These perfect us in piety and rapidly load us onward to the hope of eternal life and make us heirs of the kingdom of heaven by the aid of Christ, the Savior of us all, by whom and with whom to God the Father be praise and dominion with the Holy Ghost forever and ever. Amen.